Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the insulin receptor. Okay, so we've now discussed how the insulin receptor is going to uh, lead to uh, the activation of cell division within the cells uh, that it has been activated on. Okay, so now what we want to talk about is how the activated insulin receptor is going to lead to uh, these other um, things that we've seen, such as the implantation of glucose transporter 4 uh, proteins into the cell membranes at adipocytes and skeletal muscle cells, and how it's going to lead to the activation of glycogen synthesis in skeletal muscle cells and hepatocytes. Okay, and this is through a quite different pathway, basically, but it has the same starting point. Okay, so the starting point is that you have the insulin receptor uh, substrate phosphorylated. Okay, so let's say we have our insulin receptor substrate here again, and basically its uh, phosphotyrosine binding domain up here has bound to the phosphotyrosine residues on uh, the beta subunits of the insulin receptor which has been activated. Okay, I haven't shown that just to save a bit of time. Okay, and it has now had its uh, own uh, tyrosine residues phosphorylated, so it has a few phosphate groups sticking off here, and these are phosphotyrosine residues. Okay, and what's going to happen is another enzyme which has an SH2 domain is going to come and bind to this insulin receptor substrate's uh, phosphotyrosine residue. So remember, we saw uh, the GRB2 protein had an SH2 domain and will come and bind here, but we're now going to look at an enzyme which has an SH2 domain and is going to come and bind here. So, here it is. Okay, and here is its SH2 domain that is bound to this phosphotyrosine uh, residue here, like so. And remember, SH2 stands for SARC homology 2. So this is an SH2 domain, a SARC homology 2 domain. Okay, now what is the name of this enzyme? Well, the name of this enzyme is phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase. Okay, so this is called phos fatidyl inositol 3 kinase and this enzyme has now bound to the in uh, insulin receptor substrates uh, phosphotyrosine residues and it is now very close to the membrane and that's very significant uh, that it is now positioned close to the membrane because its substrate which is going to be phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate uh, is present within the phospholipid bilayer. So once this enzyme, which is often abbreviated to P for phosphatidyl, I for inositol, and then 3 and then K for kinase, PI3K, or PI3 kinase is often what people call it. Once this enzyme has bound to the phosphotyrosine residues of the insulin receptor substrate, it's now closely positioned to uh, the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, and its substrate is going to be present within the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. So let me now discuss the reaction that it's going to catalyze. So basically, uh, the substrate for the phosphatidylinositol free kinase enzyme is a molecule known as phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. So phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. And this is a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer, basically. So what I want to convince you of is that phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate is just a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer, and that it is really just a modified phospholipid. It's just a normal or boring old phospholipid with a little bit extra stuck on its head, basically. And for short, phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate is often abbreviated to PIP2. The first P is for phosphatidyl, the I is for inositol, and then the second P is for phosphate, and then because we have two phosphate groups, one on four and one on five, uh, PIP2. Okay, so let's start off by drawing the structure of a normal uh, boring old phospholipid, okay, and as a cartoon we'll show it like so. 
Okay, so let's colour in the different components here. So these vertical lines, which I'm now colouring in in orange here, these represent the long chain carboxylic acids. So we have two of them, uh, and they are esterif sorry, they are yes, they are esterified uh, to the first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. Okay, so these are long chain carboxylic acids, which basically means a carboxylic acid molecule with a really long tail. Okay, and long chain carboxylic acids uh, used to be called fatty acids, and occasionally they are still referred to that. Long chain carboxylic acids is the proper name for them, uh, but some people will still call them fatty acids. Okay, right. Uh, now, um, these fatty acids, or long-chain carboxylic acids, they are esterified to the alcohol groups, the first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule, which really is the backbone of the phospholipid structure. So this is glycerol. And the other name for glycerol is that it's also called propane 1, 2, 3 trial. And although propane 1, 2, Free trial is a bit of a uh, mouthful. It's a useful name in that it uh, tells you exactly what this is. It's a free carbon hydrocarbon where you have alcohol groups coming off the first, the second, and the third carbon. Okay, so propane one, two, free trial. So off the first and second alcohol groups, you then have these long chain carboxylic acid groups esterified there, and then off the third alcohol group, you have a phosphate group, which I'm showing here is this pink dot. Okay, so this is the structure then of a normal phospholipid, and the old name for a phospholipid was to call it a phosphatid date molecule. Okay, so I'll write this over here, because I want to leave this space open here. So the old name for a phospholipid was to call it a phosphatidate molecule. And although you'll never hear anyone refer to a phospholipid as a phosphatidate molecule, when people are referring to modified phospholipids, phospholipids with a little bit extra added onto them, we use the term phosphatidate all the time. That is where this phosphatidiol comes from. That just means phosphatidate with inositol stuck onto it. Okay, so what we're going to do is to create phosphatidyl inositol, we're just going to bind an inositol molecule to this phosphate group here. Now, inositol is a six-membered carbon ring, okay, where all of the carbons in that six-membered carbon rings uh, are singly bonded to one another. So all of the bonds are single bonds, okay? That means that all of the carbons in this six-membered ring also have two other bonds which need to... Uh, be um, pr uh, saturated, basically. Okay, now, in each case, one of them is to a hydrogen atom, and one is to an alcohol uh, group. Okay, so this has six alcohol groups coming off it. Okay, another name for it is cyclohexane one, two, three, four, five, six hexol. Okay, so you have an alcohol group coming off every single one of those carbons. Right, uh, so, you attach the alcohol group of this first carbon up here onto the alcohol group of the phosphate group that is spare, basically. One of them has been involved in the phosphoester link to the third alcohol group of the glycerol molecule, but you still have one spare, and this will be involved in the uh, binding, again, by a phospholipid, sorry, a phosphoester uh, bond to the alcohol group of the inositol molecule. Okay, so this ring, then, uh, is inositol. So where should I write this? I'll write it here again. Inositol. Okay, right. Uh, specifically, if you want the specific optical isomer of inositol, it's usually myo inositol. But if you don't know about the optical isomerism of inositol, don't worry about it. Okay, so now naming the carbons. Basically, if you want to name the carbons in the inositol ring, you start here with one. Then you go round two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and basically we have an alcohol. Sorry, we have phosphate groups off the fourth carbon, its alcohol group, and then also off the fifth carbon's alcohol group. So we have these two phosphate groups here to create you finally phosphatidyl inositol four five bisphosphate. So so far the phosphatidyl 
is this portion up here. The inositol is the blue ring. The 4,5-bisphosphate is these two phosphate groups off the 4th and the 5th carbon. And you might ask, well, why is this not called phosphatidyl inositol 3,4-bisphosphate? Why is this not the third carbon? That has to do with the optical isomerism. Basically, it's not as trivial as it might seem. Okay, uh, myoinositol's carbons are labelled up in a certain way, and this one that this phosphate group is attached to is the first one, and the this is the fourth one, and then this final one is the fifth one. So basically, if you imagine having these six carbon atoms in a plane, okay, and each carbon then has a hydrogen atom and an alcohol group going coming off it, okay, and Basically, either the hydrogen can come out of the page towards us and the alcohol group can go into the page away from us, or the alcohol group can come out of the page towards us and the hydrogen can go into the page away from us. So it means there are a lot of optical isomers of this molecule. All six of these carbons are chiral centers, basically, and there are actually nine different optical isomers of inositol. So this is a specific optical isomer of inositol, and the carbons are named in a certain way, so it's not rotation rotationally symmetric basically and uh, myoinositol is not a rotationally symmetric isomer of uh, inositol okay so there is a reason that it's phosphatidyl inositol 4,5 bisphosphate as opposed to phosphatidyl inositol 3,4 bisphosphate okay right now uh, this molecule as I hope you can see now is just a phospholipid with an extra big head it's had an extra structure added on to its phosphate group head okay that sort of extends into the cytoplasm and basically this is a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer and this is the target for the enzyme phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase this enzyme is going to stick a phosphate group onto the third alcohol group of the inositol molecule here, or the third carbon's alcohol group of the inositol molecule. So what's it going to convert this molecule now into? Well, let's now think about how we would name this. It's still phosphatidyl. We've still got the phosphatidyl group up there. Okay. It's still inositol. We've still got the inositol ring, so it's still phosphatidyl inositol. But now we have three phosphate groups, and they come off the third, the fourth, and the fifth carbons of the inositol ring. So it's phosphatidyl inositol 345 tris phosphate. And for short, phosphatidyl inositol 345 tris phosphate is often abbreviated to PI for phosphatidyl inositol, P for phosphate, and then we've got three of them, so you put a three there. So it's PIP3 or PIP3. Right, so uh, the phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase converts phosphatidyl inositol 4 5 bisphosphate into phosphatidyl inositol 3 4 5 trisphosphate. Now, this is not a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer, and the reason is that there is another enzyme uh, that is present in the um, phospholipid bilayer, which basically breaks down phosphatidyl inositol 3 4 5 trisphosphate back into phosphatidyl inositol 4,5 bisphosphate. So it chops off this phosphate group on the third uh, carbon's alcohol group uh, in the inositol ring. Okay, and this enzyme is known as uh, P10. Okay, so uh, P10 stands for uh, the phosphatase uh, and tensin homolog. Okay, so let me just write this down over here. So P10 stands for, the P is for phosphatase, okay, uh, and then the 10 is for and tensin homolog. So phosphatase and tensin homolog. So P10 is the phosphatase and tensin homolog. And this enzyme breaks down phosphatidylinositol 345 trisphosphate into phosphatidylinositol 45 bisphosphate. Okay, so basically when this enzyme phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase becomes active temporarily, what happens is that a bit of phosphatidylinositol 45 bisphosphate is converted into phosphatidylinositol 345 trisphosphate, and it's there temporarily until the uh, phosphatase and tensin homologue has had time to break that phosphate group off the third carbon and convert it back into phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.